a few technical difficulties first thing in this morning. Um, I hope you've all had a great weekend and your uh, your team had a good win on the weekend. Um, and thanks for joining us this morning. So quick housekeeping. Um, hopefully you'll be you're all on mute as you've come in. Um, I can see that we have a good number of you in at the moment, so that is fantastic. If you would like to ask a question of Steve, um, please find the chat function. Hopefully it's down the bottom of your screen. Um, put your question in that and then we'll be able to ask uh, Steve as well. So how this is going to work this morning is we're going to have uh, Steve do a 30 minute presentation and then we'll open up to the questions at the end. So I'm going to hand over to Steve um, who's going to tell us a bit about himself this, uh, before we launch into our mouse issues in WA. So over to you Steve. Thanks, Joe, uh, and thanks everybody for signing in so bright and early over in the west. Um, I'm talking to you from Canberra today, where it's um, it's um, bracing eight degrees at the moment, um, but uh, at least we haven't had a, a walloping big frost. Um, a little bit about myself, because I haven't presented um, over in the west before. Um, when I left school a long, long time ago, I spent ten years farming in the southeast of South Australia and in Western New South Wales, um, initially on a wheat sheep property in, in, at Bordertown in South Australia, and then on a grazing property in um, Western New South Wales, where we were shearing about 16,000 sheep off 120,000 acres. Um, since then, I've worked at CSIRO um, for about uh, 28 or 29 years now, um, always working on pest animals, both in Australia and overseas, and over the last 12 years, I've um, focused my attention primarily on rodents um, in Australian cropping systems and in Indonesia as well, rice field rats. Um, so that's enough about me. Um, let's get on and talk about mice and the situation that you guys might be facing at the moment. Um, in terms of the outline of the talk, I'm going to talk a bit about the current situation. Um, give you a little bit of, of stuff around mouse facts because it's good to know your enemy and it's good to know why mice become a problem so quickly, particularly um, now that you guys are starting to experience mice uh, maybe a little bit more often. Um, I'm going to talk about the critical considerations in the lead up to harvest um, and as the crop ripens and develops and, and how to get on top of this emerging situation that you're going through at the moment, but also give a little bit, we'll pay a bit of attention about what we might be thinking about through the summer and next autumn in the lead up to sowing the next crop because if you guys have the crop that people are talking about, then that's going to put a lot of food in the system for mice and that's going to sustain mice through the summer into the autumn and hopefully we won't be going into uh, an autumn sowing with lots of mice present. Um, when is it best to bait and why? And then I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about our latest research, particularly about the work that we've done on bait and the formulation of baits. Um, okay, so numbers and extent. Um, undoubtedly in Western Australia we're getting um, more and more reports of um, high numbers of mice through Geraldton and, and Ravers Forb. Um, certainly higher than num higher numbers than normal in the spring, and the reports are around primarily damage to um, early developing canola crops where flowers and, and pods are being chewed, um, but also other, um, other legumes as well are being damaged. Um, if we come back over east, we talk about patchy high numbers through Queensland. Um, certainly, New South Wales had a quieter winter than they've had, um, but we've still got some significant concerns for the spring because we're still getting reports of patchy high numbers. Um, in Victoria, we, we had quite a few reports of high numbers when the crop was sown and there was a fair bit of baiting as the crop was sown. Um, and now we're getting again reports of patchy numbers through the winter time and, and similarly in South Australia. So that all leads us to be quite concerned about what might be happening as the crop starts to winter crop starts to ripen right through the Australian cropping zone, um, but also leads to concerns for the uh, summer and and autumn of of next year. Okay, some mouse facts. Um, 
I hear lots of talk about field mice and hybrid mice and a, a mixture of, of wild, wild native mice and, and introduced mice. The mice that you have in your paddocks are Mus musculus domesticus and they're the introduced house mouse. They probably came to Australia uh, with, or probably with the first fleet. Um, and they're one of the more successful species on the planet. They're everywhere where humans are. Um, and the rumor is that they're even in Antarctica at Casey Station, um, where they uh, probably uh, stowed away and ended up inside the base there. Um, they start breeding when they're six weeks old and they can have a litter of six to 10 pups every 19 to 21 days after that. The kicker in all of that is that unlike a lot of other animals, within two or three days of them giving birth to their litter, they can then fall pregnant again with the second litter. So while they're rearing the first litter, they're gestating the second litter, and as soon as the first litter is weaned, at about three weeks of age, they give birth to the second litter. So there's no break in pup production. I'll talk a little bit about how that leads to mice going from, oh look, I've got a few mice around, I don't think I've got much of a problem, but within three to six weeks, you've got a major problem because of that rate of breeding if conditions are favourable. Um, Breeding starts in the spring and can continue through to the autumn, which is exactly what we saw through northern New South Wales and southern Queensland last year, where conditions were absolutely perfect for breeding and it was sustained right through the summer um, at really high levels because we had a moist, warm summer um, that was perfect for mice. Um, mice need food and shelter. Yeah, that's, that's der factor. Everything needs food and shelter but they need moisture to thrive. And in the, in the season that you guys are having over there, there's plenty of moisture and that's going to sustain breeding through the spring and into the summer. Mice can get the moisture that they need out of the food that they eat. And so that's why mice are in the system all the time, often at numbers lower than, than are detectable but when conditions become favourable, you've got the food, shelter and moisture, that's when they breed to really high numbers. And of course, that rate of increase is dramatic. Um, some ugly truths about mice. There's nothing I would like better than to see raptors and um, snakes controlling mouse populations. Unfortunately, top-down regulation of eruptive species isn't a thing. So while we might see more birds of prey, more snakes, more foxes, more cats associated with mouse outbreaks, it's essentially a lag response. So as mouse numbers go up, conditions become favourable for those top-down predators, and so their numbers increase, they're, they're breeding um, their survival rate goes up. So we see more of them around. We'll never see a plague of them because their rate of increase is simply not great enough. I've had questions over east here about a plague of snakes. No, that's not gonna happen. Um, so unfortunately, the presence of any of these predators won't regulate a mouse outbreak. They will affect the way mice behave. And so if you, have an area where there are lots of, of birds of prey, the mice change their behaviour in relation to the risk of predation. But certainly, unfortunately, predators don't regulate these populations. The other question I get all the time is, can't we find a Khaleesi virus for mice? Unfortunately, there are no Khaleesi viruses for mice. I'll talk a little bit about diseases later on, but that's more around human and animal health than it is around um, a disease that affects mice. Uh, when mice get to really, really high numbers, um, I often hear reports of, of farmers saying, oh, well, they're seeing these diseases, you know, lumpy tail and those sorts of things. And it's a combination of those diseases um, in conjunction with them running out of food um, and really high numbers of mice that lead to mouse numbers crashing off um, in that classic way that we see at the end of an outbreak. 
Okay, so what are the things that we need to consider for our winter crop now? Um, and I guess the, the, the real question, and it seems like a silly question, is do you know what's happening in your paddocks? And uh, one of the things I, I talk about a lot is getting out of your utes and going through a walk through your paddock to look for those signs of damage. And, and not all paddocks will be the same. So a lot of the outbreaks that we hear about are, are in some cases relatively localised and they're based on paddock history. So paddocks where you have sown into big barley stubbles or paddocks where the, the previous crop had had some a head loss prior to harvest, there was lots of food left in those paddocks, are the ones that I would be focusing on to look for those signs of damage. And the classic signs of mouse activity are, and, and as per the picture on the, on the right hand side of the screen there, is damage at the node. So as the head runs up and starts to form, mice start climbing up and chewing into the, into the stem just above the node. Uh, later in the crop, as the head starts to fill, you see uh, chewed heads. And in canola and uh, legume crops, we see chewed flowers on the ground and chewed pods. Um, and they seem to be the classic reports of, of damage. Um, I've talked about are all paddocks are the same? And the answer is no. You need to walk through multiple paddocks just to make sure that you're not missing some of those key signs. One of the things that we're concerned about is that overwinter survival of mouse populations establishes the breeding potential for spring. So if you have a high level of overwinter survival and conditions are favourable in the spring, mice start, um, mice start breeding from a higher population base and the rate of increase is much higher. So what we're saying this year is be prepared to bait before your crops ripen and put all of that other food in the system. Because other food, apart from the bait, actually dilutes the effect of the bait. Um, I'm going to talk more about alternative food and, and why it's a problem later on, but keep it in your head that if you can put your bait on the ground when there's the least amount of other food around, that gives mice the best possible chance of finding the bait and getting a lethal dose. Um, I know it's a little bit early now and your focus is on protecting your crop as it develops, but considerations for summer and autumn are also really important because after you get this crop in the bin, um, the, if there are mice present, there's nothing that will make those numbers decline through the summer and, and autumn if, if climatic conditions are favourable. So again, it's a matter of getting out of your ute and going for a walk through your paddock to look for those signs of damage. Um, the best way to find those signs of damage in, in, um, in the autumn, uh, looking for active burrows, you know, walking through your stubble. Um, the way I do it is um, I walk 100 metre long transects and I count all the active burrows along that 100 metre transect in a one metre wide strip. So that gives me a count of active burrows per 100 square metres. And then I do three or four 100 metre transects and I average it. So I get an average number of burrows per 100 square metres. Now, if I've only got one burrow per 100 square metres, and this is why it's really important, if you've got a burrow just outside your transect, don't add it in because you're adding a, a burrow per 100 square metres. Now, if you've only got one burrow per 100 square metres and you multiply that up to burrows per hectare, then one burrow per 100 square metres equates to 100 burrows per hectare. Now, if you've got, say, two mice per active burrow and you've got 100 burrows per hectare, oh, that's only 200 mice per hectare, that's not that much. But if 100 of those have six babies every three weeks, you're only six weeks away from a major problem. So what, what we're saying is 
that when you think you've only got a few mice, you're probably not very far away from a major problem if you've got food, shelter and moisture in the system. So I guess we're trying to counsel against complacency uh, when you are seeing a few, few mice around. Um, if we're, one of the other things that we're going to talk about is so you don't get a problem down the track is, is how much food do mice need um, and how much food are there in your stubbles and in your crops for mice. Now obviously you can, you know, as the crop ripens you're going to put a huge amount of food into the system. Um, you're then going to take that off in the form of the harvest but you're going to leave some behind. So there'll be some pre-header losses and some post-header losses, you know, that grain that comes out the back of the header. Now my understanding is that you guys are much better at measuring the grain that comes out the back of your header than people over in the east are, but people tend to be genuinely shocked by the amount of food that's left behind uh, when we start to talk about it. And, and in one system we measured about 150 kilos per hectare, uh, which doesn't sound like a heck of a lot, but that equates to 50,000 mouse days if you've got that much food in the system. So let's talk about why it's important. Um, mice eat up to three grams of food per day. Um, that equates to 20, there are 22 grams in a, sorry, there are 22 grains in a gram. Uh, therefore a mouse needs 66 grains per day. And that's probably about one head, but you can be sure that a mouse is gonna damage about five or six other heads in the course of getting those 66 grains. There are 22,000 grains in a, in a kilogram and, and certainly over here in the east, and I suspect it will be the same in the west, we get frequent reports of significant loss. Now through the Wimmera over the last at least two seasons, they had pre-harvest loss due to wind events in barley crops of about a tonne to the hectare. That equates to 2,200 grains per square metre. Now, if you're baiting into that sort of a food matrix, then that's a lot of competition for the attention of the mouse if you're only putting three grains per square metre of bait into that matrix. So reducing food and managing food in stubbles, but also putting bait on the ground before there's a lot of other food in the system is critically important. So reducing food um, is a key measure for getting better control of mice. Um, we're seeing um, increased but gradual adoption of seed destroyers um, and that's going to be the focus of some of our research is just how much food seed destroyers do take out of, out of stubbles. Um, I know there's more chaff lining and wind rowing over in the west than there is over here in the east. Um, and that also helps to consolidate food, but also provides potentially an, 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 um, an opportunity to control mice. So at the point when you're burning your narrow windrows, if you've got mice present, that takes a lot of food and shelter out of the system. And at that point, if you're putting bait on the ground, you're putting bait there when there's less food, less shelter, mice need to be out scurrying around in a, in a high risk environment. They're gonna grab whatever food they can find as quickly as they can find it. If you've just put bait on the ground on the tail of, of removing those windrows, then you've got a really good chance of mice discovering that bait and getting a lethal dose. Chaff lines are a bit different and certainly in the, some of these hybrid production systems over here in the east where guys have been chaff lining, um, what we actually found was that the chaff lines are so dense that the mice weren't prepared to take the risk of searching through those chaff lines to find the food and in fact they depleted the food from other parts of the paddock before they accessed the chaff line. If you've got sheep, uh, use them and I know there's a lot of people in the past had been going away from sheep altogether. Uh, but over the last few years, the sheep have become more valuable. More guys have been going back into them. So use them to deplete food while conserving cover. Um, I don't need to tell people about spraying out germinations. You do it all the time. Um, but that's one of the things that helps to remove food from, from the, the system. And 
Um, the last point on this slide is one that I'm always very reluctant to talk about, but I would argue um, that if you are incredibly brave, that high numbers of mice reduce food ahead of sowing, and that affords you a really good opportunity to bait mice um, just before you sow the crop after they've reduced as much of the residual food as possible. Um, so I guess baiting and other food is, and I keep going back to this point, I know, but if you've got 2,200 grains per square metre, and I know a lot of cases you won't have that much food in the system, but it's a, it's a good example. Um, when you're putting zinc phosphide out at one kilogram per hectare, that equates to approximately three grains per square metre. Now, if you've got a heap of other food in the system, you can see from those two diagrams at the bottom of the screen that if you've got a whole lot of food there, the chances of mice finding that lethal dose of zinc phosphide are much less in a system where there's lots and lots of food compared to that, that diagram on the left where there's hardly any other food. Now, up until just recently, um, we um, thought that every single grain of zinc phosphide was a lethal dose. And uh, we thought that um, it killed them really, really fast. Um, and uh, all the mouse needed to do was get one dose and the job was done. Uh, I'm going to come back to that point remembering that we've been baiting for a lot of years and farmers have been doing multiple applications of bait to get the results that they need. Um, another factor that's been changing that's leading to, to potentially more frequent mouse outbreaks is the um, con conservation tillage results in favourable conditions for mice. So in the past, um, as a result of a lot of work that was done in conventional cropping systems, um, we established that mice lived at the margins of paddocks and invaded paddocks as conditions became favourable out in the paddock. And they lived on the margins because there was lots and lots of disturbance and um, that disturbance meant that they weren't able to establish burrow networks. Um, now with zero till and no till systems, um, there's no disturbance, there's lots of crop residue, there's lots of food in these systems. The only time the paddock's disturbed is when you sow the crop. Um, there are lots more people showing with discs, so there's almost zero soil disturbance, but that cr creates favourable conditions for mice and they live in the paddock all year round. The other thing that we're starting to focus on, and it may not be as important in the West, but um, farming systems that have a significant grazing component to them provide pasture that acts as significant refuge for mice um, in times when conditions aren't favourable in stubbles or in crop. So be aware of those kinds of things, be monitoring pastures um, and be prepared to deal with mice in crops that you sow adjacent to pasture systems. Um, the other thing that you guys do over in the West more than we do over here is chaff lines and windrows. Um, when I first started looking into chaff lines, I thought they'd be a wonderful place for mice to live. Um, but certainly over here where we've, where we've looked into chaff lines in a fairly high production system, about a four tonne system, um, the chaff lines were so dense that the mice actually didn't didn't live in them or under them, and they actually had to search through the chaff for food, so it made it a bit risky for them to do that. Um, conversely, though, windrows provide a, a much more favourable environment for mice to live under. Um, they're way less dense. There's um, more struck. Well, there's less structure in them, so that they can move in amongst them, and there's plenty of food because you've consolidated all of that uh, weed seeds and a fair bit of um, residual grain in those windrows, so they're ideal scenarios for mice to live in. Again, if you're removing mice from those, uh, if you're removing windrows from a paddock after, as you burn them, that's a great time to bait mice. 
Okay, I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about the some research that we've done in the lab um, in response to stuff that we were hearing from farmers. Um, back in oh, look, look, 2017, 2018, um, we started to hear more and more reports from farmers that zinc phosphide wasn't working the way that they expected it should work. Um, particularly one guy in the in the Wimra told me that he can baited on three or four occasions, uh, followed all the instructions, baited over a broad scale, applied the bait under the best favourable, um, most favourable conditions for applying bait, and he still wasn't killing bait. That forced us to start to ask some questions about what would make the bait more attractive to mice and would make them more willing to go and <coughs> and find the bait and, and get a lethal dose. We did some trials in the lab using alternative bait substrates. So if mice were living in a barley stubble, happily eating barley, why would they transition to wheat with zinc phosphide on it? Um, so it was a new thing. So when we tried this in the lab, we found some reasonable candidate substrates and then um, put zinc phosphide on it and we fed it to mice individual mice in individual cages. So we knew exactly how much bait they were eating. <clears throat> on the first night of this study, oh, excuse me, on the first night of the study, nearly all of the mice ate what I would have thought would have been a lethal dose. And we only killed half the number of mice that we expected to kill. So that made us start to ask some different questions. Maybe it wasn't bait substrate at all. Maybe we had been selecting for mice that were tolerant to zinc phosphide over the last 15 or so years that we'd been applying the bait. So we then went back to first principles and did the experiments that tested the sensitivity of mice to zinc phosphide. And so to do that, we had mice from an area, wild mice from an area where zinc phosphide had been spread um, pretty consistently over the last 15 years. We had naive mice from around um, stables near Canberra that had probably never ever seen zinc phosphide and we had lab mice. And when we put zinc phosphide directly into the stomach of the mouse, and you can see that in that image on the right hand side, um, it's a little bit like drenching sheep. Um, it, except instead of just putting it down the throat, we actually put it all the way down into the mouse's stomach. Um, and when we did this work, we found that there were no differences in the level of sensitivity between any of the groups, which surprised us a little bit. But what we did find was that mice were half as sensitive to zinc phosphide as we thought that they should have been and as was reported in the original study that was done in the US in 1988. So that's led us to go down the path of, of the development of the what we're calling the double strength zinc phosphide bait, but basically it's zinc phosphide mixed at 50 grams per kilogram of wheat. Um, because we wanted to make sure that every single grain of wheat with zinc phosphide on it was a lethal dose. The other thing that came out of these studies in the lab was the rate at which mice refused to eat bait if they got a sub-lethal dose. So if a mouse on night one only ate half a dose of zinc phosphide and didn't die, it stopped eating the bait straight away. It didn't touch the bait again for the entire study. So that was another thing that really highlighted to us how important it was that every grain is a lethal dose. Because if you've got sub-lethal doses out there in the paddock and a mouse eats an entire grain that has a sub-lethal dose on it, the time it takes to find the next grain with zinc phosphide on it means that it's probably starting to feel sick and won't touch that subsequent dose. So really important that they get a lethal dose the first time they encounter the bait. Um, so then the next thing we trialled was, all right, if we can put 50 grams of zinc phosphide per kilo, or we can make that bait, 
then how effective will it be in a field setting? We know we got some really promising results in the lab, um, so let's take it out into the field. Um, we did some work around parks in the central west of New South Wales where they'd been pretty heavily impacted by mice. Um, we had nine sites, um, three sites where there was no baiting, uh, three sites where we baited with the standard uh, zinc phosphide with 25 grams, and three sites where we baited with the standard um, bait of, sorry, three sites where we used the new 50 gram zinc phosphide. Um, at the control sites, we saw no difference in the population pre-baiting and post-baiting, um, but the results showed for the 25 gram bait, that you get a medium and variable chance of killing a high proportion of the mice. So sometimes it'll work really, really well, and other times it won't work nearly as well. And you get the full range from work, working fantastically to hardly working at all. Conversely, with the ZNP50, you've got an, a very high chance of killing a high proportion of the mice. The results showed that greater than 75% of the time, you will kill 90% of the mice. Now this is work that we're just about to publish, um, but we were, were really encouraged that we could really make a difference by using the, the ZNP50 bait. Um, I know you guys are going to ask questions about um, timing of spreading in terms of weather conditions. Um, I've always been nervous about spreading in under wet conditions. I think the bait is probably more durable than I think it is. Um, and an example of that was that um, I went to parks to spread the bait on a Friday um, morning. Uh, we'd had 25 millimetres of rain on the Thursday and uh, furrows still had water lying in them on the Friday morning, so I opted not to spread the bait. I, I spread it on the Saturday. Um, under, you, know, you can see from the photo, under clear skies. Um, we had a, cl a clear dry night on the Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night. On the Tuesday, they had another 24 millimetres of rain. Um, and we were still getting dead mice in traps the following Sunday. So that suggested to me that the bait was more durable than I expected. Having said that, if I was spending thousands of dollars on mouse bait, I would want to spread it in the most favourable conditions. So if you can wait till after that rainfall event goes through and then get the bait on the ground with three or four dry days, um, after you've spread the bait, I think that that gives it the best chance possible of getting an effective knockdown. So in summary, um, yeah, monitor your developing crops for mice. Look for those signs of damage, pods being chewed, flowers being chewed, uh, in your cereals, go for a walk, look for, for um, chewing at the node, chewing of heads. Be prepared to bait before alternative food is available. So if you can get bait on the ground before heads filled or pods are filling and the mice are, are switched on to those alternative foods, you've got the best chance of bait uptake. One of the things that happened up in northern New South Wales in the summer crop, um, I think, is that before they realised they had a problem, the mice had done so much damage to the sorghum that there was sorghum all over the ground and essentially they were baiting into a... a a matrix of a huge amount of sorghum, and that meant that the bait uptake was was significantly impeded. Um, so you know, bait before there's other food around. The other thing to do is continue to monitor to ensure you have effective control. Get out and go for a walk after you've baited. I think that that's something that hasn't happened terribly much in the past. You know, you guys are really busy. You put the great bait on the ground. You, you assume that you've done a really good job. I think it's worthwhile going back and having a look just to make sure. Because if you haven't got the kill that you've expected to get and there are still mice in the system, we know it's only that three, six weeks away that you're going to end up with a problem again. Um, 
focus on harvesting clean, the less food that you leave in the system means that you're supporting less mice through the summer and into the next autumn when they'll be causing problems when you sow the next crop. Um, the other thing is I've spoken briefly about the research that we've done on baits. Um, we were also doing, you know, GRDC have investments underway aimed at minimising the impact of mice and crops in a whole lot of other areas. So we're focusing on things that farmers do that might make a difference that will help us be more strategic in the way that we control crops. Sorry, that we control mice. Um, there's a number of people to to acknowledge, obviously, the GRDC for their investment in this intractable problem. Um, the mouse management group um, that comprises farmers and agronomists from across the country. Uh, we have a scientific panel that we consult before we do any work, make sure the work that we do is um, robust, scientifically robust, and it means that we can say something at the end of it. Um, we have an expanding rodent management team here at CSIRO that are trying to get across as many of these problems as we possibly can. Um, we have a range of farming systems, um, cropping groups that collaborate with us. And of course, the most important thing is the farmers who allow us to do the work and access their paddocks for research. Um, this is a research sources page and I'll leave it up um, as we answer the questions. It has a link to the GRDC uh, mouse landing page. And on that site, there's a, a series of resources that you'll find helpful, including the um, the template for mouse chew cards, which I haven't spoken about much. Um, if you're looking for mice in your cereals, as well as looking for those signs of damage, uh, mouse chew cards on the ground at this time of the year that are soaked in canola oil are a really effective way to, to see those signs of damage. And there's some really good description of how to use them and how to assess that damage at this site. So um, at this point, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Steve. That is some really good information there. While you're talking about the two cards, um, there was a question about using A4 paper um, because there's a lack of stock um, card locally. Um, so there's a bit of a discussion on the um, chat line about using beer cartons um, soaked in canola oil and they work as well. What I have no. forgotten to mention is that we do have Lee Nelson, who is our, the GRDC uh, pest manager, our national pest manager, and we also have Georgia McGeerian, who's the local crop protection manager in WA as well. So Lee did answer that question about using plain paper, and that's still okay to use. Is that correct, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. The problem with using beer cartons is by the time you've got enough empty beer cartons, you don't care about the mice anymore. <laughs> so, so yeah, look, we 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 yeah. use just not we use just normal paper in our chew cards, um, and it's it's really easy to manage. It doesn't soak up too much oil. Um, but I pin the chew cards down using roofing nails, but paint the top of your roofing nails with fluoro paint. So if a fox comes along and pulls out the cards, uh, you can find the nails again after they've been pulled out. That's a great idea. And yeah, so the growers up in Uno, you can stop drinking so much beer, you can use paper. Um, now, well, another question from Tim here. Apart from direct feeding damage, uh, can we quantify the damage mice do in foraging for food? So non-direct feeding damage. Have you done any work on that, Steve? Yeah, we, we the, there's been work done over the years and, and the um, the science is a little bit conflicting. So people talk about thresholds and how many mice it takes to, to cause economic damage. Uh, that's something that we're starting to focus on now. Certainly in a season like this, um, where you have uh, damage after the crop has germinated, particularly in cereals, uh, you actually get some crop compensation and people say they can sustain a relatively large amount of damage and still have the crop compensate. Um, unlike, um, unlike cereals, canola and the legumes are an entirely different problem because mice tend to browse um, canola and um, lentils and, and to a lesser degree lupins 
post-germination, they actually snip the whole plant off and it's gone at that point. So after your cereals get out of the ground, they'll tolerate some level of browse because of that compensation and they'll just run up more tillers in a good season. Um, but yeah, we need to be much more vigilant about damage in canolas and legumes. Okay, that's really good. I, I have had that issue in my pots for the field day season. I've lost quite a few killers to mice browsing. Now, why don't mice breed over winter and what is the minimum temperature that is required for them to breed? Um, I don't know what the minimum temperature is. Uh, lots of animals stop breeding through the winter because breeding is, um, is resource heavy. Um, and the winter is the time of the year where mice are just struggling to survive. So, so what they're doing through the winter time is converting food into energy to stay warm and stay safe um, and get through the winter and be there to breed um, as the spring starts to develop. And so it's probably a combination of increasing day length, um, increasing temperature and that extra food in the system in spring that kicks breeding off when they're starting to say, all right, there's actually a surplus of food around, that means I can get the energy I need to continue to breed. Thank you very much. And keeping on the breeding um, theme, if the babies grow fast, and this goes back to your how fast, that <laughs> three weeks I think it was, um, they can, um, rebreed um, and they have if the babies grow that fast and they have near adult juveniles in the nest and then we bait and kill the adults but in a few days or a week the juveniles that survive leave the nest and repopulate the field I have just baited. Yeah. So is that a real issue that we're going to see? Um, there may be a portion of them that are mature enough to get up so anything that's Anything that's um, that's just recently been weaned will be up on the surface feeding and should come in contact with the bait. Hopefully most of the animals that are in the nest are not mature enough. If you've killed the adult, then those babies that are in the nest should die. There might be a small portion of them that are right on that weaning cusp that where they can potentially get out of the nest. But yeah, it's, that's why it's always important to get out and, and monitor what's going on so that you're sure that you've done a good job. That is great. Um, so with our significant winter rain and in some areas uh, induced waterlogging and inundated crops, um, we've hopefully reduced some mice numbers. So does that provide a lower starting point for breeding? that something we can look forward to if we've had some waterlogging issues? <laughs> uh, well, I guess, yeah, I, I would have been hopeful that that was the case, but but given the reports that we're getting out of, particularly out of Geraldton and to a lesser degree down around Raisinthorpe, um, that suggests to me that you've had some um, relatively high level of overwinter survival. Um, in northern New South Wales last year, um, they had some huge rains just before Easter. Um, and I was out talking through those regions and asking people if they thought that that rainfall event had killed mice. And the perception was that it had slowed them down, but they hadn't gone away and they had continued to breed. Um, they also spoke about um, pasture and mice decamping out of really wet stubbles um, and into pasture where there was lots of food and lots of shelter for them to get through. And then they were reinvading cropping paddocks after that. Okay, so even though we've got some inundation and water logging, we're still going to have some mice. Uh, yeah, look, it's yeah, look. I think it's really worth continuing to walk through those paddocks. Now, maybe those paddocks that are, are really, really wet, maybe not, but certainly the reports that we're getting are of uh, certainly in, in canola paddocks and other legumes um, of pretty high levels of survival through the winter, and and mice starting to put a, a a fair few early developing pods on the ground. Okay. While we're talking about that, so the growers up in the northern agri region, they've baited canola and lupins um, in some cases. Um, will mice then, like if they've um, 
if they've been killed in lupins and canola, are, are we likely to see more damage in cereals? Should they be monitoring cereals as well? Oh yeah, look, I, yeah, there's no reason to suggest that if you've got them in canola that they'll only be in the canola. It's the the cereals will be a little bit later developing, but I, I would certainly be walking through my cereals looking for the signs of damage because obviously climatic conditions have been good for mice. Um, it depends a little bit on the scale at which they baited. Um, obviously, the broader scale baiting, the broader the scale of the baiting, the better the effect that you get. But I would be continuing to walk, walk through cereals to check, um, just because you know if, if we're baiting now before there's a lot of other food in the system, it, it helps us reduce the breeding potential of the population. Okay, and going on to the fact that we're having such a good season so far. Um, with the large canopies and the full canopy closures of some of these um, canola and lupin crops and cereal crops for that matter, um, how is it that, um, how hard is it to get the baits to the ground? And is that where you get the best control if the bait is actually on the ground? Yeah, you do get the best control if it's on the ground. Uh, I'm, despite these crops being huge, um, I, I I think that you'll get most of the bait on the ground. The chances of it hanging up in canopies is actually probably lower than, than we expect. Important to adhere to the 14 day withholding period prior to harvest. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I would be hopeful that most of it would get on the ground, uh, particularly if you get some wind events that would dislodge it, any stuff that was hung up as well. Um, and I can't see an alternative to flying it onto some of these really big canola crops. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I do recommend if you do have a question, everyone, please type it into the chat as we go. Um, now, Steve, your discussion about um, reducing harvest losses. So if we use a, t a seed terminator, um, that reduces our food supply for the summer and the mouse numbers reduce, um, will they then build up again from that lower base rate and uh, will that become an issue in coming into seeding? So, yeah, again, we haven't done a lot of research on destroyers. The logic of it to me is if the, you know, the more food that you take out of the system, um, the less animals you sustain through the stubble and to be there the following autumn. It depends a bit on summer conditions as well. Um, so yeah, if you, yeah, the less food that's in your stubble, the less mice you sustain through the through the system. But remember, it doesn't take very much food to to keep a mouse going. And yeah, that 150 kilos, and I'm not sure if that's a lot for the West or a little. Um, but yeah, that 150 kilos per hectare sustains 50,000 mice for a day. So yeah, you don't have to have a lot of food to sustain a, a lot of mice. That is a scary amount of mice. Um, I'm glad. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> well, we're not seeing numbers quite that high at the moment. It's a it's a thousand <laughs> mice for 50 days, but yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's giving me a phobia. Um, now. <laughs> Uh, back to your baiting, so does the weight of the mouse impact the dose that it requires? So how do you correlate for mass of the mouse in the yeah. previous work? And did your previous yeah. work do this? Yeah, so we did that in the lab. And so we gave a, a known dose and it, it turns out to be milligrams of zinc phosphide per kilogram of mouse and we accounted for that. So the, the, the numbers that we're talking about for mixing bait at, work at um, basically an, enough uh, toxin to kill a 20 gram mouse. Um, the average weight of mice in Australia, and I did this by going to our database, and there's about 20,000 mouse records in our database and, and just ran an average through all of them, and the average weight was 13 grams. Um, so you get mice down to eight grams that we catch in our traps and up to 20 grams. Or 22 or 23 grams. So, you know, working on that average weight of mice, we think that that 50 gram bait will kill a significant, well, will kill 90% of the mice. Okay. So, 
keeping on the baiting issue, um, so it, this is the first time most of us have baited. Um, so will the actual strength matter? So if you can only get the zinc phosphide 25 rather than the zinc phosphide 50, will that matter? Okay, so you've still got you've still got a chance of getting a good result with the 25. What I would do is put it out under the most optimal conditions I possibly could put it out under. So uh, if you've got dry conditions, uh, the least amount of food in the system as possible, um, put it out under that scenario, but then continue to go back and monitor. So yeah, I, if you had stores of 25 or 25 was all you could op access, I would use it monitor the effect, so keep looking. Okay, and any bait that's not eaten by mice, is that lethal to any of our domestic stock? Okay, so they would need to, I think a sheep needs to eat 3,000 grains of the 25 before it gets a lethal dose. Um, and if it's spread at three grains per square metre, and that assumes, assuming that you put it stock straight in after you'd spread it, yeah, they'd have to be pretty effective um, grazers to, to find enough to get a lethal dose. Um, okay. you know, it's a toxin, be careful of it, uh, would be my the way I would work on it. And, and remember that it's, there's no license to spread it in pasture as well. Um, so it's only licensed for um, broad scale dis distribution in crops. Okay, and having said that, is there a withholding period of putting stock into stubble as well as harvest? Not as far as I know. Lee might be able to help with that one, but I, I don't think there's a withhold for stock. I again, I would not be putting. Um, I I would do it the other way around. So if I was going to bait a stubble, I would put my sheep in first, use them to deplete as much of the residual grain that was in that stubble, I would then pull the sheep out and bait because that gives you the mice the best chance of finding those lethal grains. That is good to hear. Um, looking at the formulas as well, so not all products work the same due to the change in the formula. So for the work that you did, was that a commercial product uh, with your zinc phosphide 25? I'm not quite sure what. So what we did was we we used zinc phosphide of of, of a known um, purity, and right. and and then put that into the animals at a at a specific dose rate. So so the work that we did for the LD50 trial was we actually you actually suspend the zinc phosphide in oil and put it directly into the mouse's stomach based on the purity of the zinc phosphide and the weight of the mouse. Um, so, so that was that your, was for that one. For your board scale work at parks. So for the board scale work at parks, we actually had to wait, and I should have said this actually. So the results of that work, when we communicated that work from the lab to all of the bait producers in Australia, uh, grain producers Australia, uh, the GRDC, and the APVMA, <coughs> um, that led to the application for an emergency permit for the 50 gram bait. We waited for that emergency permit to be granted and then did that work at parks with some commercially prepared ZNP50 bait. Okay, that's good to know. And we also um, we also took some grains from that and they're in the process of being tested. So both the 25 and the 50 gram, we've got them at an independent laboratory in, in Melbourne being tested for the amount of zinc phosphide that's on each grain. Okay. Um, great. So with the two cards, so going back to the two cards, so uh, can you use other oils other than canola or is canola the one that's most reliable? Um, again, this, not, this one's not terribly scientific. We use canola because we know that mice like to eat canola seed. Um, and we use also a little bit of, a, we add a little bit of um, linseed and that was just because I got, historically I got the recipe from someone who had done this before. Um, I've heard of people using vegetable oil. Um, the idea is that the canola oil is essentially a, an attractant um, yep. and something that the mice will be willing to eat. Um, 
I wouldn't use uh, now what. Look, I'd heard that safflower oil wasn't attractive, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Now, I, I would. We've always used canola oil, and it seems to work. Now the okay. the chew the chew cards work way better when there's less food in the system. So as the crop's developing, um, after the crop's been harvested, I rely more heavily on counting active burrows, and. And as or the other thing is, as the crop's developing, it's actually more difficult for me to see active burrows, so the chew cards become more valuable. So it's using the different methods. I use them. I still use both of them every time I do it, but but I rely more on one or the other depending on the phase of the crop. Okay, that's good to hear as well. Um, back to baiting so is head emergence in wheat too late for baiting or is it just best to go when you see damage i i would still go when i see when i see damage uh, anecdotally um talking to someone from the wimmera in 20 uh who was farming during the 2010 2011 outbreak in in western victoria um they had a, a heap of mice as they sowed the crop, and then they thought that mouse numbers had disappeared or mice had disappeared through the winter, and they all became quite complacent. And this guy said that they got absolutely smashed in the following spring. So, you know, I, you know if you've got head emergence, I, it's not ideal, but if you're seeing those signs of damage, I would still be putting bait on the ground. Okay. Yep, and we've certainly got some head emergence happening in our wheat as well. Um, yeah, because your, spr so your spring's a bit earlier than ours, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's definitely, it, it's freezing at the moment um, here in York in, this lo in my downtown shed. But um, yeah, it's um, going to be a lovely day. It's going to be very spring-like over here. Um, Okay, to our bait strength. So if we have zinc phosphide 25, and that's the only access we have, only bait we can access, is it better to use two kilos to, uh, per hectare, or is it still only recommended to use one kilo per hectare? Yeah, the, um, the recommended, well, sorry, not the recommended rate, the rate for application is one kilo per hectare. Um, yep. And so that's that's about 22,000 doses per hectare. If there's not much other food around on the ground, um, they should be able to find multiple doses. Yeah, that obviously the best option is is the 50 gram at one kilo per hectare. Um, again, go with the one kilo per hectare for the for the 25, but continue to monitor. Okay, so double the bait is not recommended. Um, so now, if uh, is there a difference between cows and sheep grazing, or is it just the disturbance that will do the damage to the mice? So I, I would say that, yeah. Well, and again, I'm not 100% sure, but but sheep are much better at hoovering up that that spilled grain. The advantage of the of the sheep in stubbles is that that they um, they hoover up all that residual grain, and when there's less grain in the system, then you're a better chance of getting that bait uptake. Um, the other advantage of, of sheep in stubbles is that the grains that they don't eat tend to get pushed into the soil surface, and that enhances germination when you do get those summer rainfall events. Um, and you get if you get a better germination, you spray out more of the food that's in the paddock. So. Uh, it's that combination of eating and and pushing grains into the surface. Great. Um, now Neil has asked how long are the zinc phosphide baits active for? So yeah, so so it depends entirely on the conditions when you spread the bait. Um, if you if you've got it stored in in airtight containers, zinc phosphide doesn't seem to break down. But again, I, I would be spreading it as soon after purchase as I get it, and I would be spreading it into what we would deem as ideal conditions. You know, the drier, the better, and that will lead to it lasting longer in the environment. Um, our understanding is that it will take, um, it will sus be sustained quite well through a rainfall event, but it will be less, um, uh, 
it will be uh, less effective if you have a, a like a week of wet weather or drizzly wet weather where it's constantly wet. So it will handle some dry wetting and drying, but it won't handle continually wet. Um, so if you get a rainfall event that's coming, hold off your baiting. Let the rainfall event go through, let things dry out a little bit, spread your bait on the tail of that when you've got two or three dry days. All right, and hopefully we have currently two or three dry days. Um, I think the forecast certainly around York is for more rain maybe tomorrow, but hopefully by Thursday is our earliest and we'll get a bit of drying out happening. Um, now, Lee has just added to the chat, harvest and grazing withholding periods are both 14 days. So that is great to know. Um, now, I have uh, another question for you. Um, can you, why haven't we seen a plague since the 1970s over here in the West? Is there something that we're doing differently since then? Um, that's a long time ago, the 1970s. Um, my understanding is that over there, there are certainly not plagues of this proportion more frequently, but there are more frequent localised outbreaks that are probably a result of the change in cropping system. Now, you guys have been great adopters of, of zero and no-till, and as you get more and more crop residue and less disturbance, that creates conditions that are favourable for mice. In terms of of why you don't have these frequent big outbreaks like we have over here in the east that's still a little bit um, not understood. Um, but you know, one of the concerns is that we're getting more frequent reports of higher numbers from the, the west, but thankfully they're not those sort of widespread out, outbreaks like we've seen in the east with, with mice everywhere. So do we in the West have uh, areas that are a, a higher hotspot areas? So at the moment we've like um, the northern agri-region started earlier. You've mentioned Ravensthorpe. We've also got accounts down at 2J. So uh, do the mice move or are they just coming out now as it's warming up? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Why? <laughs> so so uh, over here in the East, um, a um, pest animal control person in the centre of Sydney told the Daily Telegraph that the mice were coming to Sydney and they'd be there in, in August. Um, and there, this, the Daily Telegraph put a, a map of New South Wales on the, on the front page of the paper and they had all of these arrows coming to Sydney from the rural areas. Uh, hundreds of kilometres away. Now, mice weigh 13 grams and they've only got really little legs, so they don't actually move across the landscape in a wave. And so, as I said earlier, mice are present in the system everywhere where humans are. And when conditions are favourable, they breed up to higher numbers. So the reason we're seeing them this year is there's that coincidence of favourable climatic conditions and food and probably some level of enhanced survival of young because conditions are so favourable and that's what's leading to them breeding up to higher numbers. Now we don't, for some reason, we don't get an outbreak every time we get a good season. And often outbreaks over here in the east occur on the end of a run of dry years. And that's something we're trying to, to tease out now is working out a why, rather than working out why we get an outbreak, working out why we don't get an outbreak every time there's a good season might be more important. Yes, you've still got a fair bit of work to go there, Steve. Uh, another well, we question, do. and I know <laughs> um, <laughs> another question. I, I think I've talked with Georgia about this, about um, thresholds, and um, do we have any thresholds? And I know you've done some work on this previously. So, so yes, so certainly um, the science is a little bit out on thresholds. So some scientists say you know, 50 mice per hectare, some scientists say 100 mice per hectare and other scientists say 200 mice per hectare. So it's a little bit out and it depends on so many variables. So if we're in a season like we are this year where the, you know, basically the profile's full of water, the, the crops are going gangbusters, certainly in cereals, that threshold will be pushed a, a fair bit higher this year because of the crop's potential to compensate for that damage. Um, 
my attitude to this would be there's no substitute for going for a walk and having a look at what's happening in your paddock and making an assessment of if I'm seeing damage, let's get under let's get it under control so that we don't have a lot of mice through the summer and into the following autumn as well. So you're reducing the damage that might be occurring in the lead up to sowing, but sorry, <coughs> sorry, in the lead up to harvest, but then you're also got that knock on effect or that benefit of re reducing the breeding potential in the population and potentially reducing that problem in the lead up to sowing the subsequent year. That is uh, really good to hear. Um, now, Murray has asked if you could repeat the rate at which mice breed. Yes, yeah, sure. Um. So, so they, <laughs> they start, and it's, it's, it is a bit scary, it, <laughs> particularly over here where we are. Uh, there's some horrendous footage of mice just flooding across the landscape here. Um, but so they start breeding when they're six weeks old. They can have a litter of six to ten pups every 19 to 21 days after they start breeding. But the kicker is that as soon as they give birth to that litter of pups, they can fall pregnant again within two or three days of giving birth. And then so while they're feeding the first litter, they're gestating the second litter. And so you get this every three weeks, you get a litter of six to 10 pups put on the ground. Yeah, that's truly scary. And I'm so glad that mice have to deal with that and rather than everyone else. So, so the, the, other, the other thing about that is that in terms of the lifespan of a mouse, and, and no one's asked that yet, but, but we think that in the wild, and it's very difficult to tell in the wild, but mice tend to live for about a year. But it's the mice that are born in the mid to late autumn that are the seed population for the following year. And so what what's potentially causing the problem this spring over here in the east is we went into the winter with really, really high numbers. And that over over winter level of survival is probably what's setting up the breeding population for this spring. Great. Um, all right. Uh, one final question that I have here. So do family groups stay in the same burrow or do they establish new burrows? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. And that's one of the things we're starting to work on is the stability of populations and whether really stable, moderate populations actually regulate the breeding of other family groups. Um, so from the work that we've done around understanding where mice live and how they use different habitats, um, while there is plenty of food in the system, mice are quite sedentary. So they're continually going back to their home burrow night after night after night. And, and that makes sense because the least distance you've got to move to get your food means that there's less risk of being preyed upon by a, an avian predator or a fox or cat or something like that. However, as food starts to run short, they have to move further and further to get the, the food that they need. And after a while, as food gets depleted near home base, it becomes not worth the risk to go back to home base. And so then that's what forces mice to move. So as they run out of food, that drives the population to move to areas where there's other food. They're not making active decisions about whether things are better next door or over in the next paddock or in the, they're actually, it's a result of foraging and looking and things are okay here, I'll stay. So you know, while there's plenty of food, they're quite sedentary. Once they start to deplete those foods, that's what drives movement. Okay, so if you're seeing activity around the perimeter of your paddock, does that reflect what's happening across the paddock as a whole? Yeah, so in, in conventional tillage systems, when we did most of the work in the past, I would say, no, I, I would say, you know, there's a chance that they're moving to and from the margin and as conditions are getting favourable in the paddock, they'll invade more and more of it. Now in, convention, in in conservation cropping systems where we've got low levels of survival, lots of residue, lots of food, mice are establishing burrow networks out in paddocks. And I think there's a good chance that while you might be seeing um, activity at the margins, that's because that's the area where you're looking, 
if you went for a walk out in the paddock, I suspect that you would find similar levels of activity right through the paddock. Now, if you're not finding that, it's probably because there's some refuge habitat associated with the margin of the paddock. So a really good pasture that's that's at a good length, lots of seeds and so forth and lots of shelter, and they might be coming out of that pasture and invading the edges of the crop at that point. But in general, in, in zero and no-till systems, I think they would be equally distribu distributed across the paddock, depending, uh, depending on soil type a little bit as well. Okay, that is um, good to know. So going back to some key messages, I think we've answered all of the questions. You've, um, I know there was a question there about how many years you can keep your baits in the shed, but I think you have answered that as well. Um, your take home messages, Steve, what should people okay. be doing? <laughs> yeah, get out of the ute and go for a walk. I know. I, 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 if you're driving through paddocks, you miss a lot of the sign of mouse activity. So get out of the ute, go for a walk, look for those signs of damage. If you're seeing signs of damage, bait early before there's a lot of other food in the system. Hopefully we get through to harvest with, with a crop that's not significantly damaged by mice. Harvest as clean as you can. The temptation in good seasons is to push harder because often the harvest window is is short. Um, slow the header down, put as much grain in the bin as you can, measure what's coming out the back of the machine, monitor your stubbles and take action in the lead up to sowing the, the next winter crop, but continue to monitor for mice. That's uh, absolutely fantastic um, information. And the GRDC mouse control page um, can be found on at grdc.com.au. So all of the information that we have um, about mice control now is on that um, link that you can see there. Um, and this website, uh, webinar, sorry, will be up there as well. Um, so thank you so much, Steve, for your time today. I will call uh, call this to a close. We have run out of questions. Um, it's been some great information. And if anyone has more questions, then please do feel free to give either myself or Georgia a call. Um, I'm sure there's the numbers are on the, um, some of you actually have our number, but you can call the office number as well. So. 92304600. Um, and we'll call it to a close there. Thank you so much, Steve, for your time this morning. No trouble at all. Thanks, Georgia. Joe, sorry.